in our series. My name is Chelsea Cravey and I'm the director of the SFO. Tonight we are honored to have Dr. Michael Humer deliver a talk on the duty to disregard the law. Before we begin though, I'd like to take a moment to introduce SFL and the webinar series to those who might not know too much about it yet. Students for Liberty is a 501c3 nonprofit organization run by students and for students dedicated to liberty. We were formed four years ago to serve a previously unfilled niche in our universities where we connect liberty-friendly students with other students in their area as well around the world. Uh, we connect them to faculty and organizations and we provide them with resources to help them advance the ideas of classical liberalism on their own campuses. Um, the resources that we offer include free books for student groups, handbooks on running student organizations, tabling kits, leadership training, and the Academic Journal for Liberty and Society, and of course our conferences. Our last regional conferences are this weekend, so if you want to see if there are any near you, please look at our website at studentsforliberty.org. Another huge resource that we provide students with is the SFL webinar series, and it's a way to give access to everybody, no matter where they are, to the ideas and mentorship in Liberty. We hold webinars every other week to put you in touch with the top mentors and scholars in the country. For a full list of who's coming up this semester, visit studentsforliberty.org. And tonight's webinar is with Dr. Michael Humer. Michael Humer uh, received his BA from UC Berkeley and his PhD from Rutgers University. He is presently Professor of Philosophy at the University of Colorado at Boulder. He is the author of Skepticism and the Vela Perception and Ethical Intuitionism, as well as more than 40 academic articles in ethics, epistemology, political philosophy, and metaphysics. He has just completed a brilliant and fascinating book called The Problem of Political Authority, which will be available this December, and everybody listening tonight should definitely buy it. And just to note, right before we start, there will be about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of the webinar. If you have a question for Dr. Humer about this topic, feel free to type it into the question box on your control panel during any time of his lecture or after he's done, but I won't be reading them out until the very end during the Q&A session. Um, for those interested, this webinar will be recorded and archived on our website in the next few weeks. So without any further ado, I present to you Dr. Michael Humer. All right, thank you. Thank you for that generous introduction. So my title is The Duty to Disregard the Law. And the subject is jury nullification. So I want to start by reviewing a famous historical case of jury nullification. The year was 1735, and it was the trial of John Peter Zenger, who was the publisher of the New York Weekly Journal one of the two local newspapers in New York at the time. And Zenger had published a series of articles attacking the governor of New York, who by all accounts was a corrupt and petty dictator. The governor then had him prosecuted for seditious libel. So he was put on trial. And at the trial, his defense was that everything he had said about the governor was true. The prosecutor responded that the truth of the statements was irrelevant to a charge of libel, which apparently was correct as to British law at the time. In fact, the prosecutor said the truth of the statements was an aggravating circumstance, that it was worse to, pub to publish correct criticisms of a public official than to publish lies, because truthful criticisms would be more likely to undermine confidence in the government. Now, the judge agreed with the prosecutor and all but told the jury that they had to convict. So what happened? Well, what happened was the jury came back and they said, screw that. They returned a verdict of not guilty. So this was, this was a famous case of jury nullification. And in a way, it set off the American tradition of freedom of the press. Now, more about the practice of jury nullification in general. So what is it? It's a situation in which a jury votes to acquit the defendant in spite of adequate evidence of guilt. So the jury disregards the factual evidence and the law and decides to vote on the basis of their conscience instead. Now, why would you do this? So there are two reasons. One is you might think that the law itself under which the defendant is being charged is unjust. The other reason is you might think that the law is okay in general, 
but you might think that the application of the law in these particular circumstances would be unjust. So Jack Kevorkian, pictured here, is one of the beneficiaries of jury nullification. He was three times acquitted on charges of assisted suicide, uh, even though he obviously did it. Now, he was ultimately convicted because he went too far, uh, because uh, he was convicted in the case where he not merely assisted, but actually killed the patient. Uh, however, the three acquittals were probably uh, good examples of jury nullification. There are other cases, so during the 1800s, northern juries would sometimes acquit people under the fugitive slave laws because they disagreed with the laws. These were the laws that made it illegal to help slaves escape and required you to report escaped slaves. Okay, now, this is about the legal background. There's no dispute that juries, in fact, have the power to nullify the law in this way. They have the legal power to do this in the sense that the jury's decision is not reversible. So if a jury nullifies the law, the defendant can't be charged again. It's not a basis for appeal by the prosecution. And the jury also cannot be punished for doing this. So after you vote to acquit, all the members of the jury could come out and they could explicitly say on camera that they voted to nullify the law and there's nothing the government can do about it legally. Okay, however, the practice is strongly discouraged by courts. So first of all, during the jury selection process, the prosecutor and the judge will attempt to remove anyone who might be sympathetic to the idea of jury nullification. Now, this fact might be useful to you if you're trying to get out of jury duty. Uh, if you want to get off of jury duty, just use the words jury nullification at some point during the, uh, during the jury selection process. Um, however, I advise you to not do that because I think you should serve on a jury, especially if you believe in nullification. Uh, if you ask a judge about jury nullification, they will tell you that it's invalid. They will tell you that you can't do it or that you shouldn't do it. And there are even cases in which a jury member can be removed during deliberations because the jury member is advocating nullification. Okay, so. A background assumption that I have um, is that there are at least some illegal actions that are ethically blameless. Sometimes a person is morally justified in doing something that breaks the law. So here's one case. Uh, these, are, these are people on the Underground Railway in the 1800s. So people used to help slaves to escape from the south, to escape into the north. And that was illegal. It was illegal for the slaves to escape and it was illegal for anyone to help them. And in fact, people were legally required to report escaped slaves so that they could be sent back to their masters. Right. So the people on the Underground Railway were breaking the law, but this was clearly ethically blameless. In fact, it was ethically praiseworthy. This is another example. This is a Vietnam War protester. The sign says, burn draft cards, not children. It was illegal to burn your draft card, but many people did this in protest of the Vietnam War. Uh, now, it may be that you know, either they thought the war, that this particular war was unjust, or it might be that they just thought that the draft was unjust. In either case, though, this seems like an ethically blameless but illegal action. Now, I happen to think that there are quite a lot of ethically blameless but illegal actions. Uh, I, I should think that, for example, using illegal drugs is ethically blameless. But I'm not going to debate right now about exactly how many actions that are illegal are also ethically blameless. It just matters that there are at least some of these actions, okay? So assume that you're on the jury and you're in one of these cases where the defendant did something that was illegal but was ethically blameless. So here's the basic argument. There's a very simple argument for why you should vote to acquit. The first premise is that, at least prima facie, it's wrong to cause a person to suffer unjust harm. This seems pretty obvious, so I don't think I have to give much explanation of why I think that. Second, it seems that convicting a defendant for blameless lawbreaking causes the defendant to suffer unjust harm. Why do I think that? Well, first of all, convicting the defendant will cause the defendant to be punished. And the person doesn't deserve to be punished for blameless actions. And undeserved punishment is an unjust harm. So convicting the defendant would cause an unjust harm. 
So the conclusion is it is prima facie wrong to convict a defendant for blameless lawbreaking. Now what this means is there's a pretty strong presumption against convicting a person in such a case. There would have to be some pretty strong reasons in favor of it to outweigh the general obligation not to cause unjust harm to others. Now I have an example, this is a hypothetical example that illustrates the idea of this argument. So imagine that you're walking down the street with one of your flamboyantly dressed friends when you run into this gang of gay bashing hoodlums. They ask you if your friend is gay. Suppose that you believe that if you either say yes or refuse to answer, they're going to beat him up. Okay. However, suppose that in fact your friend is gay and you know that. So, should you tell the gang the truth or should you lie to them? Now this is hardly an ethical dilemma. Right? Any person with a reasonably mature moral sense knows that the answer is, well, you should lie to the gang. Yes, lying is usually wrong, but the the importance of making uh, accurate statements pales in comparison to the importance of preventing serious unjust injury to your friend. So this is analogous to the situation of the juror in the case where the state is asking whether the defendant committed some action which is ethically blameless, but you know that if you say yes he did, the state is going to cause serious unjust harm to that defendant. Right? So hypothetically, suppose you know that the drug laws are unjust, and that you're on the jury in a drug case. Suppose you think that the defendant, in fact, did use illegal drugs, and you think that that was proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So then the state is asking you to tell it whether the person used illegal drugs or not. If you say yes, they're going to do serious unjust harm to this defendant. So just as in the case of the gay bashing gang, it looks like ethically it's obvious what you should do. You should just lie to the state and say he didn't do it. Okay, now, in spite of the obvious argument in favor of jury nullification, judicial opinion tends to be aggressively opposed to it. So these are comments from some judges. Uh, one judge says, jury nullification is indefensible. This is from Robert Bork, a very famous judge, a former Reagan Supreme Court nominee. He says, this pernicious practice occurs not only sub silentio, but is coming into the open. There is even a national organization, the Fully Informed Jury Association, to justify and encourage jury lawlessness. And finally, Judge Stegman from the Illinois Appellate Court, I write specially to express my rejection of the legitimacy of the concept of jury nullification. Careful analysis shows it to be vacuous and intellectually bankrupt. So when you hear these arguments, when you hear these comments, you might think, wow, these judges must know some really powerful arguments against jury nullification. It sounds like it's a really horrible practice uh, let's look at the careful analysis that these, these judges are referring to. So these are the objections to jury nullification. The first common objection is that if you vote to nullify the law in this sense, you will be violating the juror's oath. So at the beginning of a trial in the United States, you will typically be required to swear an oath, which seems to imply that you will not nullify the law. Commonly, you'll be asked to swear to apply the law as given to you by the judge. Okay. Well, usually it's wrong to break a promise. However, it is sometimes permissible to break a promise. Virtually everyone agrees with that. So these are some conditions under which it is permissible to break a promise. First of all, typically a promise may be broken to prevent serious harm to an innocent person. So, for example, Suppose that you've promised, uh, you've promised to pick up a friend from the airport, but while you're on your way, you come upon an accident victim who needs medical attention. You decide to stop and help the accident victim, help them get to the hospital, even though that's going to prevent you from keeping your promise to pick up your friend at the airport. Well, this would be ethically permissible, if not obligatory. So even though you're breaking a promise, it would be justified to prevent serious harm to an innocent person. Here's a second condition. A promise prompted by a threat of unjust violence is typically not morally binding. So for example, if somebody holds a gun to your head and makes you promise to, uh, to give him your house, that would not be an ethically valid promise. Right? If they make you sign away your house, this will not be either ethically or legally enforceable. Uh, and it doesn't, doesn't even matter if the threat of unjust violence is against you. So if somebody holds a gun to your neighbor's head 
and then makes you sign away your house. Again, that will not be a valid contract, right? And that's generally accepted. So it's neither legally nor ethically valid. Here's a third condition. A promise may be broken to prevent unjust actions by the promisee. In other words, if you've made a promise to someone and that person, the person to whom you made the promise, is threatening to commit unjust actions, and the only way to prevent them from doing so is to break your promise to them, then you should break the promise to them. And you don't owe them anything for doing that. The, the promisee doesn't have any valid complaint for, against you for breaking the promise because it's his fault that you had to break the promise. Okay, now all three of these conditions apply to the juror's oath to apply the law. Now, first, in the case where the defendant is on trial for a blameless but illegal action, if you keep the juror's oath, then that will be causing serious harm. So it's permissible to break the oath to prevent that. Second, you have to make the promise in the first place because the state is threatening to do serious harm to the defendant. During the jury selection process, if you don't take the oath, you will be excluded from the jury, and in most cases, that means that the defendant will be convicted. There's a probability of somewhere between 85 and 95 percent of a defendant being convicted in any given trial. So if you know that you're, uh, you're being asked to serve on a jury for a trial where the law is unjust, you have to take the juror's oath if you want to prevent the defendant from being unjustly punished. Right? If you don't take the oath, there's something like a 90% chance that that person will be punished. Okay, so um, you have to break the oath then in order to prevent unjust violence. Now the third point is um, the state itself is the one who's making the threat of unjust violence. So the state has no valid complaint against you for breaking the promise. Right, the person to whom you made the promise is the same as the person who is threatening the unjust actions. Okay, here's the second objection to jury nullification. It's frequently said, this is probably the most popular objection, that jury nullification violates this principle called the rule of law. Now, what does that mean? Uh, there are two obvious interpretations of this. So first, maybe it means that jury nullification violates the law. And the response to this would be that's just factually false. There is no law that requires a jury member to vote to convict if he thinks that the defendant did it. It's perfectly legal to vote to nullify, and that's undisputed. So the second interpretation is maybe the point is that jury nullification makes the system unpredictable and dependent on subjective human judgments. Okay, now the response to this, the first response is the system is already unpredictable and dependent on subjective human judgments quite apart from jury nullification. So first of all, if you, com if you commit a crime, um, it's highly uncertain whether you will ever be arrested for it. Most crimes are never solved. Secondly, even if you are arrested for it, the prosecutor has discretion as to whether to prosecute you or not. And almost no one says that that fact undermines the rule of law. Right? And third, even if you are prosecuted, it's highly uncertain what the trial outcome will be, even apart from jury nullification, because it's uncertain what the jury will think about the factual evidence. Now, the increase in unpredictability due to your voting to nullify the law in a particular case is negligible. The system is already highly unpredictable and it's highly dependent on human judgment, and there's only a marginal increase in unpredictability if you vote to nullify in a particular case. Okay, the second reply, is that uniform injustice is not superior to a mixture of justice and injustice. So, going back to the case of the gay bashing gang, you're there, the gang is asking whether your friend is gay, and they're getting ready to beat him up if you say yes. And suppose you think to yourself, suppose you find out that this gang has beaten up a lot of other people who are gay. So if you answer no, and then the gang doesn't beat up your friend, then there will be unpredictability, right? The system will be ununiform because some people get beaten up by the gang and some people don't. So, so should you tell the gang to beat up your friend just to ensure uniformity in the imposition of the injustice in order to make the system more predictable? 
So that seems kind of absurd. And that seems analogous to the idea that you should convict a defendant who hasn't done anything wrong just to ensure uniformity because other defendants would have been convicted. And the third point to make here is the purpose of a trial is to do justice to the individual defendant presently before the court. The purpose of a trial is not to secure some larger social policy objective. So it's hard to sympathize with the idea that you should convict and punish somebody who hasn't done anything wrong just to ensure some larger social policy objective. Now here's another analogy. Suppose that you're on the jury, and it's not a nullification case, but suppose that um, the evidence in the case, the factual evidence is unclear. Suppose you think that the factual evidence does not support conviction, that the defendant probably didn't do it, but you also think that the majority of juries would vote to convict. Okay, so suppose you think most people would think that the defendant's guilt was proven. So if you were to acquit, that would contribute to the unpredictability of the system. So should you vote to convict this person who you think probably didn't do it uh, just to ensure uniformity or predictability? So again, that seems pretty absurd. Okay, here's the third objection to jury nullification. It's frequently pointed out that the practice could be abused. So during America's more racist period in the past, southern juries would sometimes acquit people who were charged with hate crimes because the juries were racist and they were sympathetic to the defendants. So that would be an abuse of the practice. Now it's hard to see from this, it's hard to see how this gives you a reason for not nullifying the law in a particular case if you're not one of these racist jurors. Okay. So it seems like there's this suppressed premise that if an action is sometimes done for bad reasons, then no one should ever do it or if a power can be abused, then it should never be exercised. Otherwise, it's hard to see how the fact that some racist juries in the past nullified in cases in which they shouldn't have gives you a reason for not nullifying the law in a case where you know that your, your motivation is not racism and your motivation is actually the injustice of the law. Now, to see why these, why these premises are false, consider an analogy. So again, you're there with the gay bashing gang. They're asking you if your friend is gay. You're thinking of lying to them, but then you reflect that, well, in the past, a lot of people have lied for bad reasons. So therefore, does that mean that you have to tell the truth? In fact, surely most of the lies that have been told in the past have been unjustified and have been told for bad reasons. So does that mean that nobody should ever lie? So that seems false also. Okay, here's the fourth objection. It's sometimes said, well, if you think that the law is unjust, the proper remedy is to change the law through the voting booth rather than to nullify the law in the jury room. Okay, what's my response to this? First, working to change the law is perfectly compatible with jury nullification. So you can work to change the law with equal vigor whether or not you served on a jury in which you voted to nullify the law. So it's hard to see how this idea that you should try to change the law is a reason for not voting to nullify in the jury room. The second point is, if you try to change the law, the probability that you'll succeed is approximately zero. Now, I don't mean that laws don't ever get changed. Periodically, laws are changed. But the probability that you personally are going to bring about a change in the law is very close to zero. So it's hard to see how that's an adequate substitute for nullification. It's hard to see how um, that satisfies your goals. And the third point is, anyway, even if by some miracle you should succeed in changing the unjust laws, that wouldn't help the particular defendant in the trial presently in front of you. The purpose of a trial, again, is to secure justice for the particular defendant presently in front of the court. The purpose of jury nullification is to prevent that specific person from suffering an injustice. The purpose of nullification is not to change the law. Okay, so if you, go, if you vote to convict and then you go out and you miraculously succeed in changing the law, that person still went to jail, so the injustice still occurred. So it's hard to see how the political activism would have served your purpose. 
Okay, here's the fifth objection. It's sometimes said that juries are undemocratic and unaccountable institutions. The undemocratic point is, well, the jury is only 12 people, and they might well fail to be representative of the population as a whole, whereas in contrast, the laws that are made in accordance with the democratic process reflect the will of the people in general. Uh, juries are also said to be unaccountable because after the jury makes its decision, they don't even have to explain themselves. They don't even have to explain why they gave the verdict that they did. No one can challenge them. No one can revisit their decision or revise it if they made a foolish decision. So uh, it's often thought that we should limit the power of juries. My responses to this, first, um, while it might be true that the jury fails to reflect public opinion, laws also often fail to reflect public opinion. If you don't understand how this could happen in a democratic country, uh, just go look at some of the public choice literature. Now, for some examples, uh, back in 2008, there was the, the infamous financial bailout package that was very unpopular with the public, but it passed overwhelmingly in the Congress anyway. Uh, the bailout of the automakers was even more unpopular, and that also passed. Well, it didn't pass Congress, but it got through the president. So frequently, frequently decisions that are made through the democratic process also fail to reflect public opinion. Okay, the second point, more importantly, is the general public doesn't know the details of the particular case in front of the court. So even if the general public exercised good judgment in making a general law, they, they wouldn't be able to know whether in some specific case there were unusual circumstances that would make it unjust to punish this defendant. Only the jury in that particular case would know the facts of the case and would be in a position to judge whether there were special circumstances that would make it unjust to punish the defendant. Okay, third point is society should be especially cautious about punishing people. It's frequently said that it's better, it would be better to let 10 guilty people go free than to punish one innocent person. Now, if we, if we agree with the principle in general that it's better to let several people fail to be punished, who deserve to be punished, than to punish one person who doesn't deserve to be punished, it seems like, well, we should apply that also to the case where somebody would be unjustly punished because he did something that wasn't wrong. There are two ways in which somebody could be unjustly punished, right? The first is they could be punished for something that they didn't do. The second is they could be punished for something that they did that wasn't wrong. Now, it's generally agreed that it's better to let several guilty people go free than to punish the one person for something that he didn't do. And it seems like, similarly, it's better to let several people go free who deserve to be punished than to punish one person for something that, that he did that wasn't wrong. Okay. Now, the idea that you should always you should always enforce the law because the law was made democratic, was made democratically, doesn't give sufficient respect for the caution that we should have about punishing people. It allows you to punish people for things that only 51% of the population think should be punished. In contrast, the, the mechanism of jury nullification imposes, appropriately imposes a much stricter standard. Not only do you have to have the law where maybe the majority of the population think that something was wrong, but you also have to be able to convince 12 ordinary people that the person deserves to be punished. And so that puts an extra check against, against unjustly punishing people. Okay, the final point here is that majority will doesn't make an unjust action just. So suppose, for example, that you think that the drug laws are unjust and therefore that it's unjust to punish someone under those laws. Suppose then you find out that 51% of the population actually thinks that the drug laws are correct. Should that change your mind? Should that convince you that, oh, I was wrong, I guess the drug laws are just? Well, presumably not. And in fact, that is the situation with regard to marijuana prohibition. Approximately half the population supports it, um, a very narrow majority. So that seems like very weak evidence that it's actually just to punish people for using marijuana. Okay, now on to some final thoughts. How could my argument be wrong? So when thinking about what, what could possibly be wrong with my general argument, it seems like these are the only things, these are the only things you could think. Maybe you could think there's nothing wrong with causing unjust harms. 
Or could it be that punishing blameless actions actually is just? Or could it be that convicting a defendant somehow doesn't cause them to be punished? Or maybe the punishment isn't harmful? Uh, or could it be that there just are no blameless law violations? Well, it seems to me that no rational person could think any of those things. I don't see how you could think any of those things. So it's hard for me to see how to avoid the central argument. Okay, why is jury nullification unpopular? It's unpopular particularly among judges and prosecutors. Well, it might be that people have a kind of instinctive reverence for the law. And so I'd like to suggest that if you're motivated by that kind of reverence, you should remember that law is not an end in itself. Law is just a tool in the service of justice. The whole reason why we have laws is to try to secure justice, to try to protect the rights of the individual. So it doesn't make sense to prioritize preserving the law over justice. It doesn't make sense to say, let the law be enforced and justice be damned. Okay, now, the last question. I haven't really addressed this question. My question has been, what you should do if you're on the jury, what you as an individual should do. But here's another question. What should be the government's policy in regard to jury nullification? Now, the current policy is to aggressively discourage the practice. So I would like to just very briefly suggest that this seems to be a duplicitous and fundamentally unethical position. Duplicitous because it involves judges in telling juries that they can't do this thing, which they certainly can do. If a jury asks a judge if they have the power to nullify the law by voting to acquit, even though they think the defendant did it, the judge will almost certainly say no, which would be a lie. And it's unethical because it involves judges in actively discouraging people from doing something that in many circumstances is the only morally decent thing to do. Okay, now this is my final thought. I'm just going to read this quotation from John Adams, one of the founding fathers of America in 1771. He's talking about the obligation of an individual jury member. And he says, it is not only his right, but his duty to find the verdict according to his own best understanding, judgment, and conscience, though in direct opposition to the direction of the court. And so, uh, with that, I'll conclude the presentation, and then I'll take questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Humer. And so, everybody, if you would like to ask a question, as I mentioned before in the beginning, just go to your control panel and click the question tab, and then type it in there, and I'll get it, and I'll read it out to Dr. Humer. Um, and while you guys are doing that, I will briefly mention an opportunity for you guys to post a response blog about this topic. Um, after every webinar that we have, we ask people who want to maybe continue the discussion or who have longer thoughts that can't be concluded during the Q&A to write a response blog post and then send it to our SFL blog manager and we would publish it online. So if you're interested in doing that, our blog manager's name is Casey Given and his email is C given, C G I V E N, at studentsforliberty.org. Okay, so the first question we have is um, in, in our society today, which, which laws or policies would you say cause the most unjust harm to the most people? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there's so many candidates. Um, the drug laws are an obvious candidate because there's something like half a million people who are unjustly imprisoned under that, under those laws. Uh, the immigration laws are another good candidate because although we don't have a lot of people imprisoned, there are millions of people who want to come into the United States and are not able to do so because of those laws. Um, it's, this is not so relevant to jury nullification, though, because you probably will not. Um, you won't have to deal with one of those cases in, in a jury trial, probably. Um, yeah, I think those are the best best two candidates. Great. The next question is, have there been any cases, to your knowledge, in which an unruly juror has been placed under some sort of injunction by the court? Well, I don't, I don't know of cases where they were put under an, an injunction. I do know of a case where a jury member was removed from the jury. 
So he was removed during jury deliberations, partly because he was advocating nullification. Um, what happened was uh, the case was then appealed, and um, the appeals court overturned the decision. However, in doing so, they explained that the reason wasn't that it was, it was illegitimate to remove somebody for advocating jury nullification. The reason was that it wasn't clear that that was, his, that was the jury member's only reason for voting to acquit. That is, the jury member had also suggested some doubts about the factual evidence. Right? And so that was why it was illegitimate to remove him. Uh, so my advice to you, if you're on a jury and uh, you think nullification is appropriate, to make up some objections to the factual evidence and pretend that that's part of your motivation. Um, that way you will, it will not be valid to remove you. Great. Okay, given, <coughs> given that serving on a jury can involve significant costs in time, missed work, etc., how strong a duty do you think we have to serve on juries where nullification is applicable? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I would remind you that in most cases, the harm that a defendant is going to suffer if he's, if he's convicted is very serious. Uh, in most cases, somebody is going to go to prison, and they could go to prison for years. And prison is just about the worst place that any significant number of people has to live in our society. So there's a very serious harm. And so if it's only going to require you to miss a week of work or something, you know, it kind of seems to me like um, a decent person would serve, right? That if you refuse to serve because of the inconvenience, that would be sort of showing a lack of respect for other human beings, right? And for the importance of protecting the rights of individuals. I, yeah, I guess that's all I have to say about that. Great. The next. Great. So we have a lot more questions. Um, isn't there a risk that a jury might nullify a law that actually favors individual freedom? Yes. Uh, now, if the questioner were here in person, I would ask him what laws he had in mind. Um, okay, but I guess I can't ask that. He did. Um, he actually, he actually did mention one. It yeah. he mentioned the acquittal of the murderers of. Emmett Till in 1955? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so there could certainly be cases where the jury abuses its power of nullification. That's true. Uh, so there's kind of a question of, I mean, this might be a question of institutional design, or it might be a question for an individual jury member. If you're the individual jury member, the fact that other juries in the past have abused this power doesn't seem to be a reason for you not to exercise it. Right, so there might be other juries who use the power in a way that uh, interferes with individual rights, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't use it in a way that protects individual rights. Okay, but I might take the question instead as this kind of question about institutional design, like should we have this power of jury nullification? Um, and then and there the question has to do with what are the chances of the jury using it wisely versus abusing it? Um, I don't know. Uh, but my guess is that juries would tend to underuse rather than overuse it. So there will be cases in which people abuse it, but they're probably less common than the cases in which they use it correctly. And in fact, they're probably less common than the cases in which the jury should have used the power, but they didn't. Right? And I would also remind the audience that um, it's generally thought to be worse to punish an innocent person than it is to merely fail to punish someone who deserves to be punished. Okay, so we could have there could be several cases in which somebody is acquitted when they should have been convicted. Um, and there could be several times as many of those cases as there are cases where somebody is acquitted when they should be. And it could still be justified to have this practice. If a jury is unaware of their ability to nullify a law, can an attorney shed light on the fact in court to perhaps bring about nullification? Well, um, no, they won't. That is, the judge will probably stop the attorney from doing so. If the, if the lawyer manages to get the statement out, the judge will probably tell the jury to disregard it and will falsely instruct the jury that the lawyer was wrong. 
Uh, if the lawyer continues to try to press for nullification, he might be sanctioned by the judge, he might get contempt of court, or uh, conceivably he might be disbarred if he does this repeatedly. Um, so it's, it's up to the jury to be informed. Um, the lawyers are not allowed to inform the jury, unfortunately. In most of your presentation, you discussed the right of the jury to not convict somebody in defiance of the law. I was wondering if you thought that there might also be the rare circumstance in which it might, it might be just to convict someone in defiance of the law. Yeah, so this is a good question. This is sometimes, people sometimes worry about this in the literature. Um, if you could have a case where the jury decides to, to acquit someone um, when the law says they should be convicted, why can't the jury also vote to convict someone um, when the law says they shouldn't be convicted? So a jury might decide that the reasonable doubt standard of evidence is too high, and they might decide to convict on the basis of weaker evidence than that. Or they might think that the defendant didn't do what he was accused of, but the defendant is just a bad person and deserves to be punished anyway. Um, so that, that could happen. Um, there probably are cases in which that would be justified. Now that might be what happened in the uh, O.J. Simpson case, not the original case. In the original case, he was acquitted for murder, um, but then he got convicted on this other charge um, for stealing something. I forget the details of the case but the judge basically threw the book at him. So uh, that might have been because the judge knew that he was a murderer. So, um, and I would generally consider that to be um, fairly well justified. Yeah. What would you say to the argument that the jury is a finder of fact and not an entity that has the responsibility of determining what is just? Well, I guess I would say that's false. So, um, I mean, I, I think you would need some argument for that claim, right? So again, take the example where you have this gay bashing gang and they're asking if your friend is gay. And suppose that the gang, the gang members tell you, by the way, you're just a finder of fact. You're not allowed to judge whether it's just or unjust for us, for us to beat up your friend. Well, what would you think of that? No, well, that's, that's just a completely arbitrary statement. If some action that you're going to perform is going to contribute to serious unjust harm for another person, it's hard to see how you can excuse yourself from responsibility for that. Um, so, I mean, I just don't see any basis for a person not being responsible for the consequences of their actions, um, and especially if you're causing harm to another person. Is there any difference between the duty to disregard the law and civil disobedience and or nonviolent civil resistance? Yeah, well, there is, a, there is a difference because civil disobedience involves violating the law, and jury nullification does not. So the jury, in voting to acquit, uh, is not breaking any law. Uh, in fact, they are acting according to the way our system was designed. And this is part of why I put the John Adams quotation here. Um, Jury nullification used to be a popular doctrine, and it was probably to preserve the, the right of nullification that the right to a trial by jury was put into the Constitution. Uh, now, the defendant in the case might have broken the law, but that's quite different from the jury breaking the law. So the jury is acting perfectly legally, right? And they can't even be punished for it. Uh, so if anything, jury nullification is much less problematic than civil disobedience, right? Although I think civil disobedience is very often justified. It's even easier to justify jury nullification. Okay, the next question is, isn't it a concern that by using jury nullification in good cases, one will set a precedent and create an atmosphere that allows it to be used in bad cases as well? That is, isn't there a real link between one's own use of jury nullification in this particular case and others' use of it in the future cases? Yeah, so, well, I would say two things. I mean, first is the factual claim is not that evident. Um, there have been a lot of cases of jury nullification in the past, and it hasn't led to this um, runaway practice where juries are nullifying all of the laws or where people are getting off for murder or theft. Uh, so 
Since that hasn't happened in the past, it's highly unlikely that that's going to happen because of your individual instance of nullification. And the, the second point I would make is, well, maybe it would be a good thing if it set a precedent, right? Because, well, juries should nullify the law if the law is unjust, so maybe you will set a precedent of that, right? Maybe you'll set a precedent whereby the government is unable in the future to enforce unjust laws. You know, you might be worried about the fact that people disagree about what is just or unjust, so other juries might have different opinions from yourself, and they might look to nullify the law in cases in which you wouldn't. Um, and, you know, as I say, there's very little chance that, that's actually, that you're actually going to cause that to happen. Um, but as a general rule, I would say, um, if a law is highly controversial, then it's probably better to, to have people not get punished under that law. That is, it, it would be better in general for the state to have a hard time enforcing unpopular laws um, than for the state to be able to easily enforce those laws. Right? And that is, again, because of the principle that we should be cautious about punishing people. Right? So there is, there is a risk that a lot of people will not be punished who deserve to be punished. Right? But it's much worse to punish people who don't deserve to be punished. So we should err on the side of caution there. Do you have any thoughts on your colleague David Boonin's arguments against legal punishment? In other words, is the fact that breaking the law is punished at all grounds for nullification? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I don't know what I think of Boonin's arguments about punishment in general. But um, I do recall he told me that uh, there was a case in which he was called for, for jury duty. And during the jury selection process, they asked some question like, well, if you were convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant uh, committed the action that he was accused of, is there anything that would stop you from convicting? Um, and David says something like, well, I think I would need to know at least something about what the punishment was. Right? And then at that point, they excused him from the jury. So um, it seems to me that, well, I don't think that punishment in general is unjust, but it seems to me that if you think the punishment for this particular crime is unjust, that the punishment is much too harsh, that would also be a justification for nullification, right? Of course, you'd have to weigh the injustice of the overpunishment against the injustice of somebody getting away with a crime. Okay, so if, the, if you think the punishment is only slightly too, too harsh, then you should probably convict anyway. But if you think the punishment is way too harsh, then you should probably vote to acquit. Okay, so we've got one more question for you, and um, you've already answered quite a few. Do you believe it is ever just to not nullify? Well, so there's one interpretation where the answer to that is obvious. So if you're on the jury and you think the, you think the defendant did it, and you think the law is just and the defendant deserves to be punished, then you should not nullify the law. Right? So there are many, many cases, right? In fact, probably the majority of cases. Um, maybe the question was, is it, ever, is it ever right to not nullify the law if the law is unjust? Um, I'm not sure. There's, there, you can probably think of some cases. Um, I'm having a hard time thinking what the cases would be right now. Uh, maybe there's a case where you think the law is unjust, but the defendant did something else that he deserves to be punished for. So in that case, maybe it would be okay to punish him. Right? I mean, maybe then you should vote to convict. Um, was there any elaboration in that question of, of what the questioner was thinking of? No, that was, that was all that there was. Okay. But maybe he will respond now that you mentioned that. Okay. But as of right now, no. Okay, so no more questions? No, that's, that's all we have for tonight, at least. Um, but thank you. You answered quite a few, and you did it very quickly, too. Okay, thank so, you. I guess I'll conclude right now. Thank you again, Dr. Humer, and everybody who participated this evening. I hope everybody continues to come back to our webinars to learn more throughout the year. Our next one is in two weeks from tonight, and it's with Jeffrey Tucker.
as I mentioned before the Q&A session, if any of you want to write a blog to continue the discussion, please send it to our blog manager, Casey Given, cgiven at studentsforliberty.org. We'd love to publish it. And on a final note, shortly all of you will receive a follow-up email and you'll find more detailed information about our next webinars and you'll also receive a survey to evaluate this webinar. The survey only takes about one minute and it really helps us to improve our webinar program and make everything more interesting for you. And with that, we're officially wrapped up. So thank you for everyone's time this evening and I hope you all have a great night. Okay, are we off?